Okay, hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, which is the China Cosmetics Supervision and Administration Regulation and Claims. So I'm going to call that a CESAR for the rest of the presentation, because uh, obviously it's a really big mouthful. I don't know if that's how you're supposed to pronounce the abbreviation, but that is what I'm going to call it as CESAR. So if I say that, that's what I mean. Um, so I'm going to record this presentation and I will send out the recording afterwards. So don't worry if you need to, if you need to miss anything or anything like that, or if you need to watch it back. Um, and and also there will be a Q&A at the end. So if you've got any questions as I go through, please feel really free to put those in the Q&A box and there will be a chance to go through those. So obviously everyone's quite aware if you're in the cosmetics industry, especially if you're selling in China or looking to sell in China, that these new regulations are gonna come in on the 1st of January, so very, very soon. Um, but obviously every, there's a lot of kind of new changes in. So I really wanted to focus on claims in particular and kind of help everyone really break that down and what the new regulations are and their impact on claims, uh, because obviously that's what I'm specialist in. So the agenda today, um, I'm going to do an overview of the China cosmetics market, uh, just to get us into the kind of headspace for today. Uh, we're going to have a little overview of what, C what is CESAR, um, because just to kind of overview it. Um, and what that impact is for claim substantiation regulations. We're going to look at the NMPA guidelines because that is the main thing that we're looking at for claims um, and what they're saying particularly to do with consumer testing um, because that again is what we conduct. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm the Regulatory Director at ACE and Global Research. Um, so we are specialists in consumer research, um, so anything to do with perception claims. We conduct research for all FMCG industries, but cosmetics is really where our specialism lies, simply because it's where you see the most claims. Um, so compared to any other industry uh, I've ever tested for, um, co co cosmetics is where you're really saying the most about your product. You want to really show off your benefits and stand out against your competition. So we have to be really aware of what the regulations are surrounding this because we need to make sure the evidence we're providing you with is you know, going to be up to standards in your key markets um, and is going to be regulatory compliant. So that's really what my specialism is all about. Um, so things like providing webinars like this, but also having one-to-one -one contact with our clients to discuss projects uh, and basically make sure exactly that, that you're going to be compliant. So certainly uh, the CSR regulation is really a huge thing for us because we need to make sure that um, the tests that we're running in China are going to still be compliant and that that evidence that our clients might have previously had or that are looking to get in the future is also compliant with these new regulations. So obviously I've had to break it down a lot myself anyway, and that's really what I wanted to do today, is to go through how I've understood the regulations and really impart that knowledge for you guys. So just to get us into the kind of feel of the Chinese market for cosmetics, uh, I've got some excerpts for some market research and some news articles, uh, just to really talk about you know, why should you be selling in China really? Um, so it's the second largest consu cosmetic consumer market behind only the United States. So obviously if you're selling cosmetics, it's a really big market to be in, a really good one to be in. Uh, this is all spurred by urbanization. Um, so sort of cities kind of being built and, you know, people living in a kind of place altogether, essentially. Uh, a higher income, uh, which obviously people like to spend lots on themselves when they're earning more money. Um, and a mature consumer education. So people being more informed about the products they're buying. Again, this is really where claims come in um, because people really want to know what the benefit is about your product. Uh, things like branding is very important as well, um, but certainly they really want to know what the benefits are they're going to get when they do, have your, when they do use your cosmetic products. Uh, there's still a really um, dominant foreign funded enterprises playing the dominant role. Um, so basically, we mean kind of uh, import cosmetics. Um, so things like L'Oreal, Estee Lauder, these kind of really big companies are still really at the top of the list when we're looking at what people are buying in China. So there's some kind of domestic market, but really um, it's all kind of coming from uh, foreign companies. And high end trend is really uh, apparent. So basically, you know, anything that looks prestigious, um, anything that feels luxury is really what um, the Chinese market is looking for. So maybe kind of look at putting your brand that way as well. Um, so online shopping has obviously become huge. This was pre-COVID, I'll talk about COVID a little bit in a bit, um, but it's still been a huge. Online shopping is really where it's at. Um, and there's also been a rise in men's skincare. So that's also an interesting thing as well. 
Um, as I said, I want to talk about COVID because I like to talk about COVID in all my webinars. It's a global pandemic that is affecting all of us and I feel like it can't be ignored. Um, so you, it's kind of a bit different now. When I was doing these presentations at the beginning of the year, it was sort of saying, oh, COVID's, you know, really... Um, kind of affected the industry and there's no one making sales. It's kind of the other way now where we're saying, you know, sales are being made, but how are they being made? And certainly it's online, as I was saying uh, just before. Um, there are, there's been a, an increased prevalence of Chinese owned companies, but 86% of that is still, as I was saying, the um, foreign companies. I think the point of bringing it up is to say, whether you're domestic to China or whether you're outside of China, it's a good market to be getting into. It's just growing um, for both kind of sides. Um, but yeah, certainly to think about it, if you're a global leader, it's definitely a huge market still. Um, and I really want to talk about online sales a bit more. So the reason I kind of keep bringing this up, it's something really important that we've thought about, is that if you're selling online, you need to be very, very aware of the uh, global advertising regulations, um, all the advertising regulations and all of the cosmetic regulations that are going to be in place when you're selling in that country. So even if you are you know, UK based, EU based, USA based, it doesn't really matter. And China isn't your main market, if you are selling there online, you really need to be aware of these regulations um, because you don't want to find yourself getting into hot water just because you were kind of like, oh, well, we might sell in China and not really giving it an awful lot of thoughts. Um, so making sure your claims are compliant is obviously really at the top of the list there. That's what most of your advertising is, is going to be your claims. Um, so yeah, be really, really aware. I also found this really, really interesting as well. Um, so this came from Cosmetics Design Asia and they were talking about live streaming e-commerce, which has become really popular in China. It's become really popular globally, um, but certainly in China as well, um, especially during COVID and things like that because um, you know people weren't able to necessarily go out and look at products so people were doing live streams to say this is how I'm using the product uh, this is my skin tone everything like this um, but what um, so we had Heidi He from Chemlinked kind of came out and said that there's problems such as vulgar comment, comment contents uh, fake data of likes sharing and watching um, those things like false and exaggerated promotion unqualified products so this really again comes to claims it's something to be really wary of anyway with any kind of social media um, because bloggers obviously are going to talk about your product. They're going to say it's really good because you've given them usually a free product for it. Um, but if you've got no claim substantiation behind that, um, you are being uncompliant because you need to have some kind of evidence to say the product does actually work. You can't just use it on one person's opinion. Um, it would be the same for product reviews and things like that. Um, as soon as you've got your product on the market, and people are saying it has benefits, you need to have that kind of evidence in place. Um, so that's really kind of the overview of the market as a whole. So Caesar, what is it um, and what does it mean? So uh, as I said, it's going to come in in January uh, this year, next year, I keep getting confused, basically a month's time, so very, very soon. Um, what sort of things does it um, have an impact on? So there's going to be a new filing system for domestic and imported general cosmetics. Um, when I say general cosmetics, there's been updated product categories. So we've got special use and general cosmetics. Um, this has had an impact on things uh, for like things like animal testing, because general cosmetics are now going to be exempt from mandatory animal testing, um, which is fantastic because obviously that is something that the Chinese market has been quite um, brought up about in the news and things like that. People don't want to buy products that sell in China because of the animal testing laws. Um, so this is fantastic for the industry as a whole. Uh, there's new cosmetic ingredient registration and management um, and there's additional requirements for imported cosmetics but really like I said put it in bold there what I want to talk about is the new rules on efficacy testing and claim substantiation because that is where my special specialism is um, so all claims must be substantiated by scientists so it's sufficient scientific evidence and it must be made publicly available on the NMPA's website so it's very interesting uh, kind of new approach to it what are the specific parts from CSR that are about efficacy testing and claim substantiation? Picked out the articles um, that are really relevant. Uh, so the first thing is, is that efficacy claims should be based on sufficient scientific evidence, of course. And you must have to publish the abstract of the literature, the research data, or the product efficacy evaluation data on the website for the NMPA. 
um, which I'm going to talk about their guidelines in more detail. It says accept social supervision, which I just find really interesting because basically it's publicly available. Um, it's a really good way that the industry is going to regulate itself. That's generally how the industry does anyway. Um, so you'll have all your evidence out there, um, nice and ready for the world to see. Uh, and make sure that it's basically it's really on you to make sure it's sufficient before you get it out there. Um, so it's fantastic way of getting companies to really regulate themselves on their claims now. Article 37. I just wanted to bring up because obviously any labels of cosmetics shouldn't have any false or misleading content as well. So if you've got any claims on your labels, there must be sufficient scientific evidence. Um, Article 43. Uh, all, all content of cosmetics advertisements should be advertisements should be true and legal and again no false or misleading content so these are all really common terms that we're used to probably in most markets um, but it's just great to see that it's really laid out now um, for China in particular so the NMPA guidelines so the NMPA I keep saying are the National Medical Products Administration and under the state China State Council they are the ones that are going to be responsible for supervision of cosmetic products across the country so they're really who you need to know about um, if you're going to be selling in China they're the ones that are going to give you all of your guidelines and all of your information um, and everything like that and that's why you have to register your products and everything like that as well so I'm going to go through it in more detail, but to give you an idea of what this includes, uh, what their guidelines include, uh, we've got itemised lists of what should appear on the study report. Uh, we need to have uh, the report results to be accurate and reliable. We need to have standardised reports. Um, the report should contain specific analysis um, and they should show the statistic, and, um, the statistic analysis as well uh, to the standard deviation. Again, I'll talk about that in a bit more detail. Um, studies must be conducted ethically. That's obviously really important. Uh, and there's, got, there's a real um, big kind of, uh, they kind of really point out the fact that these studies should be unbranded to avoid, to avoid any bias as well. So the evaluation method, so this is something really um, interesting they've done, is they've kind of listed out all of the claims that they're expecting. Um, so you might not fall within these claims, but generally you probably will. And they have said which kind of evidence is suitable, which not many countries actually do. You kind of have to ask your testing houses and ask regulatory people um, what kind of evidence is significant. But the NMPA have literally said this is our list of claims and this is the kind of evidence that we require for it. Um, again, like I said, there may be things that come off, you know, off piece to uh, you might have claims that don't fall within this. Ask your testing house, ask us, um, and we'll certainly be able to help with that as well. But this is what they've provided. So for consumer testing, which we provide and which I'll talk about in more detail, we can substantiate anti-wrinkle, firm, soothing, oil control, exfoliating, hair break prevention, anti-dandruff, moisturising, anything to do with hair care, uh, declared suitable for sensitive skin, uh, declared mild, and uh, declare any quantitative indicators. So things like um, effect after two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but also statistics, so things like 80% of people agree, blah, blah, blah. Um, which is great, like I said, this is all laid out, which is, isn't usually. Things that have to be done through clinical testing only, um, so no consumer testing is going to back these up, is about preventing hair loss, uh, freckle whitening, sun protection, acne, anything to do with repair, um, declared tears free, and uh, declaring a new effect, which obviously makes sense. Um, so that's nothing unusual because we're very used to, like I said, in any other uh, territory really, we can uh, substantiate those with consumer research anyway. Um, so certainly that's really straightforward for us. Um, don't think that it's only consumer testing for the left hand column um, because you can also use clinical methods as well. It's just that they have very clearly said that consumer testing is suitable. We do have to be aware of how we're wording the claim um, because obviously there are certain things that consumers can perceive uh, with reference to those claims and certain things that an instrumental study would be more appropriate for. But it just gives us a really good overview on what they're saying is allowed kind of as an overview there. Um, so what are the consumer test requirements uh, in particular? So like I said, I've really brought out the really kind of important things that jump out. Um, there's a really kind of clear guidelines they've given, but um, just kind of break it down, make it a bit more digestible. 
Um, so claim substantiation must be conducted by an external research provider. This is really interesting. So any of the claims that were on that list I just showed you, they have to be conducted by someone independent. You cannot use internal testing for them. Um, so that might be very different. I know places like the USA, for example, um, there's a lot of internal testing going on. You've got big conglomerates that have their own testing houses. That is not going to be um, compliant in China. It has to be an external testing house. There are certain tests that you can do in-house still, things like SPF testing, that kind of thing, because it's not based on opinion. Um, but certainly we're looking at opinion here. Like I said, they put a really big emphasis on studies being unbiased. Um, so this is really where we need to think about it. Consumer tests should be conducted ethically. That's quite straightforward as well. Um, but again, this is something that testing houses have obviously got a lot of background in. Um, something they made really clear is there needs to be informed consent. This is certainly something that we've got built in because we had to do this for the GDPR. It was always something that we had anyway, but we've had to do it in a very um, clear kind of method. I can't think of the word. <laughs> but in a very clear way to make sure we can download all of that data um, because there has to be informed consent in place. Product safety testing has to be conducted prior to the consumer test. Again, this is not unusual, um, but it's just really important to note they've brought it up in particular. Um, so obviously to keep that in mind. Um, things like the number of consumers, the test questionnaires, the test methods, all we need to uh, meet the purpose of the test and statistical requirements. So again, really important to take um, kind of considerations either from your, if you've got people in house that are experts on claims um, and claim substantiation, or ask your research agency because it's really important to make sure these all match up. Again, this isn't unusual, um, but it's just so clearly laid out now uh, that you know you can't kind of get away with sort of doing certain things to make the brand look better or anything like that. It really has to be done um, very clearly properly. Uh, I've always talked about the test being unbranded, um, but also things about the study and the questionnaire design has to remove any bias as well. Uh, we all know that there's a certain amount of bias when it comes to research, you can't help it, um, because once you ask one question, you bias the next question, that kind of thing. Um, but again, really important to think about taking advice from your research agencies. For example, we've all been trained by the MRS on questionnaire design to make sure we can remove as much bias as possible. And essentially, you just need to demonstrate that um, when you're kind of submitting this evidence. All of the data results should be statistically significant. Um, so what does that mean? And I'm gonna talk about that in more de detail. So this is a very beefy slide. I'm sorry if this is quite, quite dry, um, but this is really important to talk about as well. So statistical significance is something that we, um, we, we calculate on a 95% confidence interval. Um, we have something that is called a p-value that is assigned to a statistic. So for example, if we are asking volunteers, uh, my skin feels soft, do you agree or disagree? Um, and they are saying on a one to nine scale, uh, there's gonna be an analysis that goes through that says there's a p-value assigned to that question based on the amount of people that we've asked it um, and what they have basically said about the product, you know, how kind of space out of their um, ideas. Essentially, we need that p-value to be below, um, less than 0 0.05 um, for it to be 95% confident to basically reject the null hypothesis. So rejecting the null hypothesis means that the question or the claim is correct and people agree with it. When we have less than 30 participants in any subgroup on a study, uh, that p-value will go up. It could go up with more people, it could go up with less people, but generally 30 people is our guideline there. Um, so we need to be really sure that with any subgroup that we have in our study, that it doesn't go any lower than that. Uh, this can get complicated if you have things like age breaks, gender breaks, uh, ethnicity breaks, anything like that that you want to look at in your study. Um, generally, we say about 50 responses provide us with statistical significance as long as there is no additional subgroups. Um, because obviously we're talking about 30 people, we have to bear in mind this is a consumer test and it is subjective. So 30 people overall is not enough on an overall study, but it is enough for a subgroup. I think that makes sense, but I will go a little bit more into that on the next slide as well. Um, so yeah, it's really important basically to think about how many people we have in your study um, in particular, because this is always important, like I said, to have significant data, but there's just such clear guidelines now about what that is and what they expect from you uh, with your statistics to make sure that you're compliant. So generally, um, every uh, subgroup um, is the one that accepts the product set, set ability. It is measured only by that group, if you know what I mean. 
Um, so if there's a subgroup that does not accept the product, so I put the example, if you hire people, you want to say uh, suitable for skin types, for example, and you had 30 people with each skin type on the study, but set people with sensitive skin rejected it, um, you would say not suitable for use on sensitive skin in your marketing. Um, but you could use the rest of the data and use that in your claim substantiation. But if this is the case, so say you had 60 people, and one of them, uh, you know, one group was 30 people with sensitive, 30 people with normal, and sensitive people reject it, you're then going to end up with a part of uh, your evidence quote, which will say from a consumer study of 30 women with normal skin in China, and that's not going to be significant for advertising because we said in a consumer study. If it was a clinical study, it'd probably be okay because it's all instrumental, so you probably only need about 30 people in a study, but consumer-wise, uh, we do need more people in there to make sure it's subjective. Um, it's still quite a lot cheaper to do a consumer study with more people than it is to do a clinical study. So that's really the benefit you're looking at. What do we need to do about the report? Again, they've given incredibly clear guidelines about the report. Um, there is are obviously the reports that we provide and you also get a kind of template uh, given to you by the NMPA, which you have to fill out with all of your uh, claims evidence. Um, so this is basically bringing up some of the really important things to make sure you have in your report. Again, we have this all built in, um, but just be really aware of it. Uh, so you know what kind of information you'd have to give us or your research agency. Um, so it needs to have complete information, obviously, and there must be a standardised format with clear conclusions and it needs to be signed by the evaluation agency. As I said, you need to have an independent testing house, so they need to sign it off as well. Um, standardised format, again, any testing house should have this, um, so it's, it's all pretty straightforward, um, but just like I said, important for you to know, really. Um, so we need to make sure we have the, your, your information, basically. Uh, we need to have our information on there. All of the product information, including the formal information, the inky list, again, we ask for this anyway, this has always been very standard for us. Uh, the evaluation basis, materials and methods, uh, so that could be any test that you're doing, you need to make sure you have that in there. All of the results and conclusions and the date, all of the panel information really clearly. Again, this is all on our reports. We have a profiling system for our participants that we use, so it's quite simple for us to get that on there. We have to have that informed consent forms uh, ready downloadable, and as I said, you can download that through our system really clearly. And we have to have some reporting of adverse reactions, that's very important as well. So, to talk about that again, so Article 6 of the CESAR regulation. Uh, basically states that you'll need to make sure you basically have some kind of adverse reaction data um, and you provide that all in accordance with all the correct laws and everything like that. So obviously we're not doing the safety testing uh, that has to be done before a consumer test, but it's a really good way of getting an idea of the, um, the, the undesirable events that could occur when people you have it in actual use because they're being sent the product in home generally and testing it as they usually would by following your usage instructions so we need to make sure that yeah what what kind of ha what kind of happens basically when people do that is that's what we're looking at um so you have to gather that through your consumer test uh, and basically prevent, present that all as well it's quite straightforward really what are the penalties um so this is the scary part so if you don't do your consumer testing you don't, well, any of your testing if you don't get your claim substantiation what is in the CSR regulation about the penalties so article 69 um is basically saying about having any false or misleading um, content uh, that you could be uh, criminally investigated. Not very nice, you don't wanna have that, so be really cautious. Um, there's also this big part about, um, in Article 62, about the um, fines that can be put in place. Um, one of the reasons of having a fine is to failing to publish abstract or references supporting your cosmetic, cosmetic efficacy claims in accordance with the regulation. So if you don't publish this claim information, you could get some really large fines there. So it's just a scary part to say, if you haven't thought about it, you really should be because we're looking at criminal charges or fines, which neither are fantastic. <laughs> So um, that's basically kind of everything I wanted to go through. I can see questions coming in already. So to summarize, all of your cosmetic claims must be substantiated, no matter what um, evaluation method you use, make sure you're with the NMPA guidelines and that you have done that. Your evaluation agency must comply with their guidelines. So if you are using a different agency now, I would very much make sure that they have been made aware of these guidelines and that they are following them. They're a very positive step. I know it sounds scary, um, but it's such a positive step 
for China. Um, so as I was saying before, even things about the animal testing, that's such a positive step. But certainly this is such a great step towards minima, minimi, minimizing misleading advertising in China. Uh, I think China's always had a bit of a reputation, not with the import, but certainly with the export of cosmetics. There was a lot of things in the news about kind of um, counterfeits, cosmetics and things like that. Um, so this is really going to reduce that because every cosmetic that's sold has to have this kind of information in place. It's such a positive step. Um, the registrant must submit the summary of cosmetic efficacy claims evaluation. So this is the summary template that you can get from the NNPA. Um, it's a bit like the responsible person in the EU. You now have a registrant in China. Um, and so you basically have a, a form that you have to fill out um, that you can use kind of the report form. Um, and always ask your evaluation agency if you're unsure of the evidence required. So as I said, there's some quite clear guidelines about which claims can be substantiated with which tests. But obviously there are going to be things that don't necessarily fit into that box. There's going to be claims that you go, well, I don't know if it actually goes into that one. Does it need substantiating? Maybe it doesn't at all. Um, maybe it does need substantiating, but it just um, kind of fits in a different way. I don't know. The main thing is, um, well, actually, I do know. <laughs> I guess that's what it is. I don't know what your problem might be, but I will know the answer. Um, so certainly reach out or reach out to your other research agencies if you are ever unsure. Um, so just a bit more information about us before I go to the Q&A. Uh, basically, we're an award-winning re research agency and we're very proud of that. Um, we, we have been always very on top of making sure that we've provided the best quality of research we possibly can. And that is including looking at these kind of regulations. Uh, we're fully compliant with the GDPR. Um, we, of course, have to be by law. But as I said, this has helped us a lot uh, with these kind of NMPA guidelines because it's all kind of been built in with everything that we've had to be compliant with already. Um, I've talked about Anasai event reporting but that is really important um, it's all in real time for our system so if people do report a undesirable event you can download that straight away and that's all made in accordance with the cosmetic vigilance act we've got full product liability insurance uh, again really big um, because if you do have any horrible um, undesirable events we need to make sure we're all protected uh, against anything that happens i've never had a case in my eight-year career at Aiton, so i'm not saying it's something common but it's always good to be protected with these things um, and that's in every single country we operate so again always be really cautious that any research agency you're working with does have that uh, we've got a couple of ISOs. So we've got our ISO 9001, which is to do with our quality insurance, and our ISO 27001, which is to do with our GDPR compliance. Uh, we're a partner to the Market Research Society. As I mentioned, we get fully trained on things like questionnaire design, study design. They need to make sure that our studies are ethical and unbiased. Um, bespoke regulatory advice, that is what I'm here for. And you also get a designated study manager. He'll be your one point of contact at our company. Um, so you haven't got to worry about being passed around sort of with the team. So there's questions already come in, um, but please feel free to ask more and I will start making my way through them. As I mentioned, my speciality is going to be very much around the claim side of this regulation. So I'm very sorry if I can't answer all of them. Um, so will the exemption for animal testing requirements take effect on January 1st? If not, by when? Again, it's not my speciality in um, kind of completely, but the regulation is coming into place in 1st of January. So I would imagine so. Um, I don't see why it would be any later than that because the whole thing should be taking, um, taking place then. Uh, so yeah, that's, sorry, again, like I said, it's not quite my speciality, but hopefully that helps. Um, so are there any new product safety requirements apart from manual testing? I think there are. Um, and again, <laughs> sorry, I'm very much claims focused. Um, but yes, there are going to be other things in there. What I would do is just take a look. They, they are published. The um, regulations are published where I was kind of showing the articles that are part of it. Um, and within that, if there's anything to do with safety testing or anything like that, there's really clear guidance to say, uh, you know, compliant with blah, blah, blah. And the NMPA, have, you know, they've released the guidelines for the claims, but they've also released the guidelines for a lot of other things. Just have, have a little look on their website um, or ask them, you know, I mean, there's they're always companies are there to help. They're not there to set the regulations and not give you any guidance. They actually want to help you a lot um, with these kinds of things. Uh, so, yeah, certainly um, kind of look at their website and ask them about those kinds of things as well. So HiCast uh, does fine fragrance come under general cosmetics and would there be, therefore be exempt from animal testing? 
again, I'm not sure in particular. Um, I'm really sorry, guys. Yeah, the product categories and the the um, animal testing isn't going to be my best um, my best knowledge here. Um, there are clear guidelines about what is a special use cosmetic and what isn't. Um, again, I, I've seen that all on the NMP website, so I think it's just worth taking a little look. Ooh. Sorry, I lose my mouse. Um, so will there be a replay? So yes, uh, there's, this has been recorded and I'll send out the recording after. So <laughs> that's a nice easy one. <laughs> Um, so are you suggesting that consumer testing for foreign suppliers need to be conducted in China? If so, that is news. Right, so interesting. Um, basically, you should always, in my opinion, you should always test a product in the market that you're selling it in um, because there's going to be different things to play. So uh, things like the ambient temperature, um, the uh you know the skin types everything like that however if you're a global company um you might already have evidence that is sufficient from another territory that you can use at the end of the day you're putting this out there um so for example i don't know if we were saying um if you were looking at something like a mascara and you were saying it's long lasting it probably wouldn't make a difference if it was tested in the uk or in china because it's going to have the same effect um there's there's not a huge difference in the climate that would make a huge difference there there's not going to be a huge difference in eyelashes so that's quite a clear one um however if you're looking at something i don't know say skin brightening uh there may be you know caucasian skin might have something very different to asian skin in terms of how the effects would be perceived and that's the case with any country um so always be really cautious there what i would hugely recommend um that we do with most of our clients that are global or that have markets say in china and the uk do a half and half study um so if your biggest market is the usa and, the, and china do half the study in the USA, half study in China. You can merge the data together to give you an overall report and you can have it separately to prove that the efficacy is accepted. That is the best way of testing. Um, again, if you, if you add other markets as well, just as long as the representation of those markets, you can do that. And yeah, it literally is the best way of testing to make sure you're compliant. Um, yeah, at the, at the end of the day, um, like I said, because this is public, I would recommend making sure you have some kind of evidence from China. Uh, because I don't know, if I was, uh, say it was the other way around and it was a product being sold in the UK, like I said, it's all publicly available. And the, the um, the evidence had only come from China, I might think, well, is it going to have the same effect over here? Is it going to have the same effect on me? I don't know. Um, so yeah, just, just sort of food for thought there, but it's basically making sure that you're very confident um, that, yeah, that your evidence is going to be sufficient there because, that, that, you know, that people will say, if not, <laughs> it has to go through this process now. Uh, so yeah, just be confident. So are literature-based claims possible for, for the claims in the consumer test column or only, or only consumer tests accepted for those? So on the NMPA guidelines, they have got some literature, literature um, evidence that's available. In any case, if you're looking at literature claims, always get the final product tested. It is just uh, something that you should be doing anyway. There is no proof otherwise that, say for the ingredients that you're using or anything like that, that it's actually going to have that effect when the consumers use it. So it's always about getting a body of evidence um, behind your claim. Um, so certainly I think literature claims work really well in conjunction with consumer testing um, because they're kind of saying now the consumer can perceive that. Um, so you don't necessarily need to go down the clinical route. It's quite a good way of getting a really good body of evidence to say we don't need an instrumental study on this. Um, but yeah, absolutely. There, there, you, there are some claims that you can use for literature based, but generally I would always recommend conducting a consumer study as well. Um, but yes, yeah, so like I said, that, that some of those claims did have literature with them, um, but otherwise it was very clearly either uh, human testing or clinical testing or consumer testing. Okay, so will this new regulation apply to any products sold across uh, border e-commerce or to only to products that are being sold via traditional trade, hence having to register in China? This is about registering in China. Um, but actually anything that goes across border anyway should be complying. Um, you should always comply with the regulations that you are selling your product, um, certainly when it comes to advertising regulations. And that's what really we're looking at here. Um, so things about having false or misleading adverts, um, you know, no claim substantiation, you need to make sure that you do have that there because those fines could apply to you uh, regardless if you're kind of doing, you know, when you say about traditional trade. Um, traditional trade is kind of one of those things that is going out anyway. Um, so if you're selling your products out online, they are going to be um, subject to these, uh, to these regulations because you're selling it in that country. And it's, it's quite similar there, uh, really. 
Okay. Um, so we're only trading on e-commerce cross-border platforms in China. Do we still, as we do not need to test on animals, do we still need to conduct the consumer clinical testing for our claims? Uh, we claim 100% natural ingredients. Do you think we need to do the consumer testing for this claim? Okay. So you need any, you do need consumer testing. Well, you need claim substantiation no matter where you're selling your product. Uh, you can't say sort of say about it anyway. So it's the same kind of thing. You need to make sure you're abiding by the regulations if you're selling in China, whether it's e-commerce or not. It's really important to do that. Um, but certainly you always need to have claim substantiation uh, because wherever you're selling your product, whether you're making your product, you also need to abide by their regulations. Um, so really important there. So things like 100% natural ingredients, that can't be substantiated by a... Um, by a consumer study because the consumer can't say, yeah, that's natural. Um, that's what we're looking at. But you do need to have some evidence to say that your ingredients are natural. There are quite clear guidelines um, about what is allowed on that um, that's been released for the EU. So even if you're not in the EU, I'd recommend looking at those um, because I'm sure you're probably selling in the EU as well if you're e-commerce based. Um, and there is really, really clear regulations on that. So yeah, do, do have a look about um, kind of natural claims, but yeah, generally, I mean, you don't want to mislead your consumers anyway. So it's always a kind of a thing with brands to say, you know, do we need this claim substantiation? Always get claim substantiation. A, it helps you know what your product does, so you can say the best claims about it because you can, you know, be really inventive then. Um, but also you don't mislead your consumers then. It's, it's, it's something that, um, that I'm quite passionate about really to make sure that you're not trying to get away with sort of saying things, but yeah, you're saying the correct things to your consumers. Um, can our firm carry out user tests in China? Absolutely. That is definitely why I'm doing this webinar. This is, <laughs> we're completely global um, and we test in China quite an awful lot um, because it is, like I said, the second biggest market. So it's somewhere we test for a lot for our clients. As I mentioned, we'll do things like cross-territory studies as well. If people are based outside of China, but also in China, have other markets. Um, so yeah, massively. Um, please do come to us if you want any consumer tests in China. Um, can be used at efficacy tests of ingredients for claims. Can be used at efficacy tests for ingredients for claims, substantiation of final cosmetic. Ah, okay, so basically, um, can we do consumer tests on the ingredients for the um, product or the final cosmetic? Um, so basically, uh, you can do it on either. Uh, generally, if you're doing an active ingredients, you'll need some kind of delivery system so the consumers can use it. Uh, so usually like a cream or something like that. Um, but we do both. Uh, so generally, we're looking at final products. Um, because usually for active ingredients, for example, you'll have some kind of clinical data uh, about the, you know, how the ingredient works. Um, so because it'd be very specific, I don't know, something like reducing wrinkles. And then when it's put into a final product, that's when we do a consumer test to say, okay, now we've got that active ingredient mixed with all of these other ingredients in a new delivery form. Is it still having that effect? Can the consumers perceive it? Um, and that's really what we're looking at. But sometimes our clients want to find out if the consumers can perceive the effect from the ingredients itself. Um, so they might have a really high tech kind of camera looking at the, you know, the improvement in wrinkles and say, yeah, this active ingredient certainly does um, have that effect. Uh, but then actually when they put it into a final product, or no, actually, um, sorry, because the high tech camera can get it, can the uh, consumer perceive it? Because obviously it's no good if they can't. Um, and actually you can't claim things like that if a consumer can't perceive it because it's misleading, really. Um, but yeah, so I think, I hope that kind of makes sense. <laughs> I hope that's answered your question as well. Great. Well, there's quite a few questions that have come in there. Sorry, I couldn't answer more about the animal testing in particular. Um, like I said, that's not really my speciality. I'm really focused on the claim and substantiation side. But, you know, don't be scared. There is so much publicly available information out there. Um, and, and it's just like, honestly a quick look on the NMPA guidelines um, that they have released on their website. Um, the actual look at the CSR regulations, have a read through. It's not that scary. I read through it myself. It's quite clear to get through. Um, it all sounds really scary, but it's not. Um, but I mean, because it's scary, that's why I wanted to do this today and kind of say for claims in particular, this is the breakdown. Um, that I found but like I said this is all really positive um, so don't feel like oh god I'm gonna get in trouble I've got the right claims this is what I also am really specialism at really specialism at really specialist at um, is doing a gap analysis on claims as well so if you've got any claims you're currently making and you have current evidence behind them very clear at saying um, 
you know what kind of evidence uh, you might need um, or what you know if it's suitable already um, and like I said we focus on consumer testing but if you need clinical testing I will tell you that as well and we have a really rich network of partners that can help with that so don't be scared this is what we're here for we are here to help um, it, it's, it's going to be really positive I think it's all really exciting um, and it's a great market to be in as mentioned um, so just to finish off, I just want to put you in the direction of the SCS, which is the Society of Cosmetic Scientists, um, which we are on the council for. Um, so they've got the SCS Diploma course, which is an industry recognised course in the essentials of cosmetic science. That can be done anywhere in the world um, and it's, it can be done at any time at your own leisure. So if it's something you're interested in, please do look at their website there. There's going to be the IFSCC International Congress, um, which is going to be in London in 2022. Hopefully when events can open back up again, we can all meet in person um, so please do register your interest for that now as well um, so there's my contact information I'm going to send out this recording um, and you also get my email address there if you need it um, but yeah I really hope that's been helpful um, and I've managed to get most of your questions if you do have any other questions that you haven't wanted to ask today just feel free to email me and I'll be really really happy to help or discuss any projects or anything like that have a fantastic rest of your day and a fantastic weekend um, and thank you very much for listening Bye.